Last time David introduced me, um, his introduction was so fantastic that I didn't have anything to say afterwards, so uh, glad that you kept it brief this time. And I was a little bit nervous that the Senator is still in the room because some of the things that I want to talk about as a producer is maybe a little bit different than the messages that we hear, um, and not to be critical, but uh, maybe I might use the word propaganda. So just to, just to go back... <laughs> It's all right, it'll come good, I promise. Uh, just to go back a step, um, I am a producer and a very blessed person to have been selected for a Nuffield scholarship. Um, and that was graciously sponsored by Horticulture Innovation Australia as one of their research projects. So that type of research is happening and the great thing about the research that um, was invested in me is that it's actually two producers and I guess that I have conversations that relate to that kind of on the ground farming. And I went off in search of how to get better prices on our farm, essentially. That was, the, that was the crux of it. And I'd been hearing all of these things about food security and being the food basket of Asia and all this potential that we have as a country and as horticultural producers. And I just wanted to go out and kind of join the dots and work out, yes, this is what we're being told, but how do I make that real on my farm and how do I ensure that we're a viable business into the future? Because the way that we've been farming is probably not something that's sustainable. And, um, the first thing that I did was go out and have a little look around the world and, and, and try and quantify this idea of food security. And the first thing I heard was there's 9 billion people that are coming in 2050 and I thought to myself, I'll be 65 in 2050, so whatever food uh, production business that I'm investing in and working in now is going to be part of feeding that, that 9 billion people. And that I really wanted to understand though why is it that if we've got this nine billion on their way and you know there's, there's all these people that are going to be here and we should be investing and innovating and whatever else why we're suffering the reality of um, sometimes very low farm gate returns um, in regards to the price for our produce right now and am i going to have to wait until i'm 65 years old before my uh, my commodity or my product is worth anything because at the moment, we've, we've got the struggle that sometimes what's happening on farm is not reflected in some of the statistics that come out. And maybe that's because I'm a small family farm uh, farmer. Um, maybe the difference is that we're not captured maybe in some of that data, but I really wanted to understand how do I put all these things together. So just to have a look at this slide, it was food security. Is it fact or is it fiction? And I went out there thinking that I was gonna see camels in the desert, um, and that's not exactly what I found. Uh, the first picture that you can see up there is me standing in Qatar in the livestock uh, market, which is where there's a lot of um, Australian merino sheep on live export boats get over to this particular market. And um, having a look at what some of those um, Middle Eastern countries are doing for their food security, because I guess we have this notion that they can't feed themselves, and I, I guess that you think that you can't grow things in the sand. Uh, the last picture there, however, is potatoes under centre pivot in Saudi Arabia. That's their local production. So these guys are pretty serious about food security. Uh, this second bubble is a fairly dodgy looking shot, but it's taken out of the plane window when I was leaving South Korea. Um, it fascinated me that between the city of uh, Seoul and to the airport, there wasn't a square inch that wasn't covered by some kind of greenhouse that was producing uh, capsicums, cucumbers, lots of different things that sometimes end up dumped uh, in our local market. And then that large bubble there is the Mitsubishi plant in Japan where they're growing baby leaf um, lettuces, spinaches and that type of thing. And if you can see that there's five stacks there, which means essentially however great a floor space that you have, you times that by five, that's how much you're gonna get out of it. And you can grow under all conditions, the waste is just about nothing. Um, and these things grow twice as fast. So we as human beings are incredibly innov innovative and I don't think that we'll be starving in 2050. And the reality is that we already have people who uh, don't have enough food already. So I guess that my search made me see that um, Food security is more about uh, political forces and uh, global political forces and how countries or how states think about their food security and what that means for, their, for the power within their own nation. Back to the Qatari example, this blew my mind, but we went out and we saw a hot house or a cold house that was in the desert. And that was the Qatari Investment Authority's uh, way of telling the world, don't worry, we've got our food security sorted out. And they're 
bringing in all these live merino sheep, as I mentioned, but they've been fairly clever. The Kintari Investment Authority has gone out with a 50 to 100 year outlook of what food security looks like for their state. And Hassad Australia, which has been set up, owns and operates 300,000 hectares of farmland in Australia, uh, and they produce quite a lot of grain, and they're producing 290,000 livestock head per annum. Now, at the moment, a lot of that livestock actually stays within the Australian market, but I guess when food security becomes an issue, that that stuff will all be going to, you know, to where it needs to go and to where it's owned. So whilst foreign investment is a terrific thing, and I think it's absolutely needed in agriculture, we've got to be thinking about what does food security mean to us here? And I'm not suggesting that we will go hungry, but when we've got this type of uh, I guess it comes down to the, the power that a country has or how secure we can feel, but we really need to be having really a lot greater outlooks. Um, and sometimes within Australia we have political agendas that are changing you know, every three or six years, and sometimes that's having a, a pretty serious effect on the ground. And I just wonder how we can get that outlook and extend it a little bit further. And coming back to the notion of the family farm, yes, we're seeing really great statistics that we've increased horticultural production and exports, and, and a lot of that is through, you know, specifically with vegetables, is carrots and asparagus, um, and they're highly mechanised uh, industries, and we are having you know, terrific outputs, but what does that mean back on a family farm that's the size of ours? So it's me and my dad, and we have about 15 staff helping us in harvest at the time of the year, and a couple of full-timers, but we're very different from these massive businesses that are doing all of the export. So in our outlook, and if we push the Australian outlook or the horticultural outlook to 50 to 100 years, is my business relevant, and, and what does that mean to the government, and what does that mean to the population in Australia? Do we need to maintain family farms, or are we looking at these larger farms where we see consolidation and, and that type of thing. We've spoken a little bit about free trade and market access and free trade agreements are terrific and we can see some of the really positive outcomes that are happening because of free trade agreements and we talk about market access and one of the examples that I saw was when I was in Japan and I was looking at capsicums and cucumbers and they were saying you can't get them in because you've got an issue with fruit fly so we have no market access there. However, Holland who have medfly actually do have access and one of the things that was explained to me was that we need to have really strong negotiators at the table and that we need to be bringing Australian food producers with us in order to get across some of these uh, protocols that exist. So market access with a particular protocol can take sometimes up to 20 years to develop. So we need to be really working on that stuff and we need to be working on it quickly because you know 20 years comes and goes. And the other issue is that internally within Australia, horticulture innovation um, actually represent about 43, 43 different commodities. So when it comes to government resources that are you know, in the Department of Agriculture who are out there you know, negotiating these protocols on our behalf, we've got an internal issue before we even get to the negotiating table, which is what are we negotiating at any one time? What's, the, what's, the, what's more important? How do we mount a business case? Is it more important to get access for cherries, uh, mainland cherries into China, or is it important for us to look at vegetables? And if we can only have limited resources, what order do we uh, negotiate these protocols? Um, we can see that India is massive and growing. China is, you know, a huge opportunity for us. But actually, in regards to vegetables, there's only about five different vegetables that can get in with market access into China. So we can talk about the fact that there's these global markets that are emerging and the middle class, and there's people that have got the money to be able to afford to buy our produce. But are we all going to be in there? And who's, you know, how do we create that list of importance of who gets in first or who, where does a protocol get created first? So that's just one of the small issues that we have, or rather large issues that we have within horticulture that we're so mixed already. And I just wanted to have a little look at the statistics, and this was some of the uh, research that was commissioned by HIA in the last few years. Um, it's the year ending June 2015, and I always go back to cauliflowers and potatoes because that's what I understand best. And, um, <coughs> excuse me, uh, the cauliflowers that pr were produced and the farm gate return price was 70 cents per kilo in the domestic market at the farm gate. If you take that to how much money a wholesaler gets paid for it, or the wholesale uh, market on it, it was 97 cents per kilogram. So you can see there, there's money in the supply chain. And if you have a look at the export dollars that we made on cauliflowers per kilogram, it was $1.96. And I was thinking to myself, why is it so difficult to get people to export when you can see that this money, you know, the difference in the money here. And the other issue that I had was that when I went out and had a look at all these different products, the biggest challenge and the biggest barrier that we have in accessing the market as Australian vegetable producers is our cost. We are, you know, sometimes four or five times more expensive than the other nations that are, um, you know, that we're competing with. And that... Um, 
as much as we can say we're clean, we're green, we're safe, we're Australia, we're awesome, uh, the reality is if you don't have, we can't afford just to be the BMW or the Mercedes, we have to be the Lamborghini in these markets because that's how expensive we are. So what are we doing to underpin the, the prices that we, we have to have um, in regards to our cost of production in Australia? So that's cauliflower. Uh, potatoes, the, the story's not exactly the same, but you can still see that there's a good return on the export market. Um, cherries, again, higher in exports, which is good. Apples, higher in exports. Uh, so this overcoming the price barrier, I'm thinking to myself when I saw those numbers, hang on, why is it that we've got a barrier in regards to price and yet what we're sending offshore we expect to get either paid more for or how is that number possible? Why is it there? And it's because we do have to value add. So yes, we're actually putting more into the product before we export it, which makes it more expensive. And it's also because at times the product before, you know, after leaving a farm and before arriving on the shores of another country has probably touched two or three hands in between it. So we do have some issues with supply chain efficiencies or potentially we don't have those returns from exports actually going flowing back onto the farm. Um, one of the issues that I encountered when I first started to try and export was that I had a, um, one of the buyers say to me, oh, I'd really, I really want mixed consignments. Um, can you find out about some lettuce for me? So I actually priced up some loose leaf lettuce and he came back and he said, oh, no, I can get it for, it was actually $8 a kilo, and all that $8 a kilo represented was the raw cost of the product, which means that in the price that he was given, there was no representation of any of the freight costs to get it to him. And I thought, how is this guy getting this product here, or product there, and, and how does he manage to do it at that price? And, you know, digging a little further, it turned out that he'd received the lettuce um, in a mixed consignment with pumpkins, so essentially the pumpkins he'd actually overpaid for, but he didn't know that. So that was, you know, the guy who had sold it to him was probably doing very well. Um, the pumpkins had paid the price of the freight and the loose leaves had basically travelled for free. So I was not able to compete. But it shows that what we need to be doing is we do need to be consolidating, but it makes it very difficult for a grower to go in there um, without some kind of vertical integration with the supply chain because you, I, how do I get lettuce to this guy, you know, for free? OK, now I'm going to have to put it on with my cauliflowers. But what that makes me have to do is form a relationship with another grower. And these relationships at the farm gate level are probably not as strong as that they could be. So back to overcoming the price barrier, we talk about innovation and it is absolutely imperative. To be the Lamborghini, you need to have some pretty special uh, features in your product. Um, some of the features that I saw around the world was this, uh, the corn that you can see there is a, a doll product. Um, what they're able to do is use their seconds in corn. They uh, vacuum pack them and they cook them up and that turns that product from being, you know, highly perishable, maybe two weeks on a shelf if you're lucky, to being something that can sit there for six months. So these are the type of things that we need to be doing as well here so that we can pay and we can be at that level. That corn can also travel um, e-commerce, uh, pop it in the Australia Post, and it can be, you know, on someone's, to someone's door in China. These are the things that we need to be doing in order to reach those markets. Um, that value adding and convenience is uh, something that, I think when I was travelling, I noticed that Australia is probably really lacking in. Uh, and maybe that says something about our preference, our food preferences, but I think it's also very much attributable to the differences um, in our our market. And the reality is that we have two retail giants who basically dictate to farmers the way they want the product to be, you know, the way they want the product to look, the way they want it to be packaged. We don't see private branding. That kind of stifles innovation slightly because what happens as a grower is that you end up putting a lot of effort into a product or a packaging or some kind of innovation that's only going to go to a very small percentage of your sales, which is your export market if you try to embark on that. And the other thing that I think that we, we really need to improve on is our ability to form and grow relationships um, with some of the people that are interested in buying our products. Uh, the top corner there is me in Japan. Um, this guy was very interested in our purple cauliflowers, so something that was specialty, that was, that was interesting to him, and that was how I was going to justify a higher price that I needed to get the freight over there and to compete with someone like China or, or the US. Um, and his stipulation to take my purple cauliflowers was that he wanted some um, samphire, 
which is, I don't know if anybody knows, it's like the seaweed stuff that you get at the beach, um, which I, you know, for getting protocols and, and getting export permits, it wasn't, I wasn't just allowed to go down to the beach and pick some stuff and get a carton on there to, to send the purple cauliflowers over with them. But the point here is that we need to be collaborating and we need to be thinking about those relationships and what do the buyers want from us? They want mixed consignments, they've got cold chain distribution issues, so how do we learn about them and how does the ordinary grower do that or how does the ordinary grower partner in a vertical supply chain or with other growers in order to actually meet these um, buyers' needs. Uh, we talked about clean, green and safe. Um, my issue with clean, green and safe is that you can say this blanket statement, but you have to actually really be clean, green and safe. And you need to have the, you need to have the proof that you're clean, green and safe. And at the moment, um, Australia, though we're, you know, we're small in population, we put out our greenhouse emissions, which is fairly small because of our, you know, the number of people. Per capita, we're the highest carbon um, polluters in the world. And that's an issue, and you probably don't really hear that too much until you leave the shores of Australia and you have people asking, how do you, you know, what do you mean you're clean, green and safe? What underpins that? Traceability is something that we need to be innovating and we need to be looking into, and it needs to flow all the way back down to a family farm my size, because the reality is most of the food that's still produced in this country is done by small family farms. So unless we work out how to embrace and get that maybe not the word propaganda, but get all these amazing things that are happening in industry and that we can see the potential in. How do we get that information flow back down to the family farm of my size? And, and that's really what I'm passionate about trying to find out about and, and trying to be part of. So our export journey, as part of the Nuffield, I did find a customer. Um, this is me standing with the first consignment of product going to Singapore. Uh, that's about as glamorous as I get on the farm. Um, there was mud everywhere, so I was wiping mud off boxes and trying to get everything right. Um, what we had to do to get that sale, though, instead of the way that we do things for the domestic market, which is into a carton or into a crate, was wrap them in tissue paper. We had to trim up all these cauliflowers and wrap them in tissue paper. So that's what I had to do to be able to justify that premium in price. And when we come back to the numbers, we grow about 50,000 cauliflowers per week when we're busy. Um, this is probably maybe 3,000 cauliflowers per consignment and I'd be lucky to get one consignment per week because the markets aren't actually that big where we do have that free trade. So, you know, you have to go a long way and, you know, my dad will say, is it really worth all the effort? The reality is this stuff that we're selling, I can actually fix a price in. So I see that the more I can fix prices and the more I can value add and actually maintain my customer base and actually, even if it means that the domestic market is higher um, and I'm going to lose some dollars, if I just keep chipping away and I know that I've got that set base price, that means something to me. But to get other growers to support that was very difficult. Uh, Potatoes, I got an inquiry for 15 container loads of potatoes per week. Fat chance of me being able to do that by myself. Despite the fact that I, the price that I was offering the producers around me um, was greater than the Australian average return price on potatoes, everybody was very, very nervous to actually help me supply into these markets because, you know, it, they've, they've been in their supply chain for a long time. And, and I, my question is, how do we get... To the, to the growers and how do we get them to change their mentality? How do we collaborate better? So where to from here? That's the question. How do we collaborate? I would love to see some of these innovation dollars um, going into packing houses where we can essentially all access that together and maybe that's through something like HIA. Um, Utilising our waste and creating more value around that waste and diversifying what we've got on farm already so that we can reach these markets. But I guess my closing point would be how do we get this great thing, these great things that are happening to some businesses in Australia to filter down to the family farm where you know, you've got that, that critical mass of food being produced. Thanks.